I think learning how to adapt to the outside world with whatever physical limitation I'm experiencing in the moment with the division or balance or whatever, figuring out how to not get overwhelmed and stressed out when I go out in public and go into new situations because I want, I mean, I very much am a person who likes to be out doing things and I don't want these things to stop me. I want to figure out a way to be comfortable kind of no matter what. So I know that sounds kind of vague, but I'm trying to kind of approach it from like a, you know, broad, bigger picture kind of outlook so that I can be adaptable. Cause you know, in my situation, you know, you have good days, you have bad days, bad weeks, good weeks, you know, I want to be able to enjoy life kind of no matter what. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryaftershock.com. This is episode 97 and my guest today is Ginger Burden. Ginger experienced a brainstem stroke and is recovering from the physical impact surgery had on her body and vision. Some time ago now, I launched the Recovery After Stroke Coaching. The people who are being coached by me are getting the support they need to find solutions to their challenges, including fatigue, anger, isolation, amongst other things. Especially in this time of coronavirus, isolation, getting to support and staying on track with your recovery has never been more important. If you're a stroke survivor that wants to know how to heal your brain, overcome fatigue and reduce anxiety, recovery after stroke coaching might be for you. If you have fallen in the cracks between hospital and home care and desire to gain momentum in your recovery but do not know where to start, this is where I can help. I will coach you and help you gain clarity on where you are currently in your recovery journey. I will help you create a picture of where you would like to be in your recovery 12 months from now. And I will coach you to overcome what's stopping you from getting to your goal. Right now, for everyone that is interested in learning what recovery after stroke coaching is all about, you get a seven-day free trial to decide if it's the right fit for you. So take advantage of the seven-day free trial now by clicking the link below if you're watching on YouTube or by going to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash coaching if you are listening online. And now it's on with the show. Ginger Bird, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for being here because uh, this is a bit of a big thing for you because it wasn't that long ago that you decided to start being a little bit more active and a little bit more public about what's going on for you what okay. actually happened to you oh gosh and hopefully i can kind of keep this sort of brief enough but um it kind of started about three years ago um i woke up one morning and had double vision in my right eye and it turned out that i had a cavernous malformation in my brain stem and they didn't want to operate right away they wanted to kind of watch and wait so we did, but it turned out I had to have an operation anyway, about a year and a half later. Um, so I had my first surgery to remove the cavernous malformation from my brainstem. And the surgery went okay, as far as these things go. I did come out of it with the facial weakness and also some damage to my left eye, um, which they were not expecting. Um, it basically doesn't have full range of movement and it kind of bounces a little bit like it's on a trampoline kind of. Um, and then, so that's what happened with the first surgery. And then about two months later, um, we discovered that I, they had not gotten all of the cavernous malformation out and it bled and created a significant hemorrhage. Um, that they told me that if it had happened to anybody else, it would have killed them. But since I had had the surgery, it created kind of like a cavity for the blood to collect in. Wow. So instead of killing me, it uh, just did lots of damage. So I um, had a lot of damage to the left side of my body. Um, I have very limited mobility in my left leg and left arm. Um, for a long time, I was completely numb from the top of my head down to my toes. Um, and this event, this hemorrhage is what I later learned was, was a stroke, but they didn't, they didn't really tell me that right away where they were just focusing on the hemorrhage and getting the hemorrhage fixed. So I went in and got a second emergency surgery 
And from what we know, what we think, they were able to remove the hemorrhage and the cavernous malformation, hopefully. Um, and the surgery went well, and I went into inpatient rehab to learn how to walk and kind of take care of myself again. And I was in inpatient rehab for about 10 days. And then I went home and I've been doing outpatient rehab and kind of home recovery ever since then. Wow, what a journey. And isn't it interesting that doctors will treat a hemorrhage, they won't necessarily talk about a stroke. And I went about I went about two and a half years before somebody finally said to me the hemorrhage that you had was kind of like a stroke but we don't call it that because it didn't begin like that it created a stroke but that's not what it was exactly and you didn't get right. dealt with by the stroke team you got dealt with by this other team and I'm like but all the issues that I'm having are stroke issues and that would have been great to know two and a half years earlier so I can connect with people who are going to help me out early on absolutely I I totally understand I remember when they sent me to the inpatient rehab they put me in the stroke ward and I was like, wait, the stroke ward? I didn't have a stroke. They're like, yes, you did. What you had essentially was a stroke. And then they treated me, luckily, I mean, I guess I'm lucky for that. They kind of treated my symptoms and my recovery from a stroke point of view. So in that way, I think I'm probably pretty fortunate. Yeah, I hear you. You had um, double vision in, you said one eye was one of the symptoms. How did you get double vision in one eye? What, what does that mean? Um, so the, the bleeding from the cavernous malformation caused a six nerve palsy. So one of the nerves that, that connects from your brain stem was damaged and it and the eye started kind of to drift inward mm. and it doesn't have full mobility. In fact, before my first surgery, it kind of had started to heal um, and started to get a little bit more movement. But then once the surgery happened, they it damaged the nerve pretty badly so it's worse off than ever now so basically you know just the eye just doesn't move properly they don't move together so I have to wear the patch to help me see essentially yeah because the other eye is perfectly fine and healthy well, and oh. it, they, like I said they they did do some damage in the first surgery oh. so yeah um at first it it also could not move fully from left to right right that's gotten better but now it constantly bounces like this, like, yeah. like a trampoline, just 24 seven. So, and they yeah. think that that will resolve, but they don't really know. I'm doing eye therapy to try to help that out, but we will yeah. we'll see. <laughs> I, I had an interview with um, a lady called Maggie Whittam. She was um, episode 47 and the episode was called The Great Now What? And um, Maggie talked about double vision and this bouncing of the eye that constantly mm. happens that makes it challenging for people. So what what is the, what, what aren't you able to do with regards to now the way that the vision is with that eye? Um, well, prior to this, I was a graphic designer. So a lot of visual work. Um, I have not been able to do that, unfortunately, since then. Um, driving, I haven't been able to get back to driving. And that's a combination of the vision and also the mobility. I have very little use out of my left arm and hand. Yeah. So I could probably maybe manage it, you know, on a on a straight, quiet road, but I haven't tried it. It might be a while before I do that. But it's just for the safety a, of myself yeah. and others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a scary thought. I thought the same thing when I first got back into the car. I thought, like, what if something happens again? And what am I going to do if... I black out and I hurt somebody. So I was really motivated not to drive. But then um, yeah. as I started to get better and started to feel confident about it, I didn't go for a drive on my own the first time. I went for a drive with a family member and then later on mm -hmm. I, I went on my own. But um, yeah, that that means that you would have a lot less ability to get out and about and therefore you're in the house more often. And is that mm -hmm. kind of how it started to for you to turn into this kind of person who was not prepared to put herself out there and talk about what was going on. Is that how that started or did yeah. it come about another way? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> you know, I never expected, like, honestly, the hardest part of all this was coming home and starting to kind of like 
faced what happened to me. Mm. You know, all of a sudden I can't, I mean, I was in a wheelchair for a few months after getting out of the hospital and I couldn't get around. I had to have help doing everything, going to the bathroom, getting dressed. I couldn't get off the couch on my own at first. And, um, you know, I, I really struggled with that. I just didn't feel like me anymore. So I didn't really, you know, I, it was just hard for me to kind of connect with other people. Um, and then when I did start to try to get out and about, um, it was just really hard. It's just overwhelming, you know, physically overwhelming. Yeah. The vision issue was kind of like keeping me from wanting to go places and it would be, it would just kind of throw me off and all of my balance issues and body issues would sort of get worse with like the stress around that. So I just kind of stopped going places. It was yeah. just, it just became too much. Um, and then, you know, over time I worked a lot on my mental and physical health and strength. And so over time I started to kind of come out of that a bit and want wanting to connect and talk to people and share this kind of new me, I guess. Um, and then, and then all this, the COVID-19 stuff happened and we, then we all went back and had to stay in our homes. So it's, it was kind of like a, uh, odd timing for me, but honestly, that sort of prior isolation in some ways might've helped me be able to cope with the situation a little bit more, maybe at least that's kind of like the positive I'm sort of trying to bring <laughs> to the situation. Yeah, um, I, agree, I agree with that. I yeah. speak to stroke survivors every day and one of my coaching clients is going through some challenges with the COVID-19 isolation in that she's she's reasonably early on in her recovery and as a result of that, it's making it a lot harder for her because she's really focused on recovering and she's a real trooper and a fighter and she just wants to get out there and make things happen and she can't. And yeah. although she's not very... Uh, She's not really the type of person who is going to be out and about all the time. She definitely missed the opportunity to go to to physio, to rehab, to all that kind of thing. And it made the it made her focus on what she can't do more mm. than what she can do because she's other other circumstances are restricting her from what she can do. Whereas myself, where I'm nearly eight years out of the first stroke and my surgery was in November 2014 when we went into lockdown it was kind of like well I've been here before like I get I get it I, I get not being able to get out and about and not doing things and whatever and it didn't really bother me so much and it's been a good opportunity to not do too much and to not exert myself and to not uh not not overdo things that being said I'll be glad when I can get out and about and catch up with people. Mm -hmm. But um, it was familiar. The, the, whole, the whole lockdown type of existence was really familiar and not, and not disconcerting. Like it, there was no issue for me. Yeah, I can relate to that too. And sometimes I kind of wonder if, you know, I'm going to get too comfortable you know, with the notion of staying home and then, you know, when I am kind of confronted with the opportunity to get out, mm. you know, am I going to be kind of once again, more wanting to isolate a little bit more? And I don't want to kind of put myself in that, that space, you know, so I'm wor working hard to prepare myself and stay as connected to people as I can in any way that I can, you know, in this situation. Um, yeah, you don't it's seem hard, like but... Yeah, you don't seem like you're going to go down that path. You contacted me, you're really keen to get on the podcast. Your yeah. posts on Instagram are starting to reflect somebody who's really willing to get out there and start talking. And I know that when you start talking, it starts to heal you and it starts to get that stuff off your chest and it starts yeah. to make you feel better. And the more you do that, the more you want to do that. And if you're connecting with the right people, um, then it's much more there's, there's much more of a reason to go out and connect and share. When I was connecting with the wrong people, people who don't understand stroke, who, and, and fair enough, they don't understand stroke, it used to frustrate me that they would do the whole, well, look great. Um, and therefore, based on how you look, everything must be amazing. Mm -hmm. And that was really challenging because I didn't want to go into a real 
long-winded conversation about how I'm actually feeling and how that cha has changed my life because they weren't a, equipped to handle that kind of information and B, I don't know that it would have made a difference to their perception of stroke because they've never been through mm -hmm. it. So you just kind of go along with it. But then when I connected with stroke survivors through Zoom or in person, it really, uh, it really felt better. And I, I, I kind of found a group of people who, what's the word? A group of people who just got me. They really got me. And we got to this weird place in the shittest way, but now that we're here, we really get each other. Yeah, that's amazing. And I haven't, you know, I'm kind of searching for that a little bit. Um, I know that there are groups here and groups online, um, but I haven't really up to this point been very active in like searching for it. But I feel like even just like the little bit that I've done in this, you know, your podcast and your Instagram account and doing this right now is like a huge help and actually makes me, it kind of validates my experience and kind of makes me feel normal because everybody else in my life, you know, no one really has experienced something like this. So I feel just kind of different than everybody most of the time, yeah. but so I, I can understand what you're saying, like finding people that can relate to you in some way is a huge part of like just feeling better about yourself and your situation and your experience and everything else. So How old I wanna thank you? you for having a podcast like this and for giving people a chance to connect in this way. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, uh, it started out as a selfish thing. It was all about me really at the beginning. And then I realized, hey, this is really strangely not about me at all. The amount of people contacting me saying it was the right episode, they needed to hear that story or thank you for sharing that. I realized really quickly, oh, okay, it's not really about me. No one really gives a crap about me. And I'm not saying it in that, <laughs> I'm not saying it in that way. They care about my story. Yeah. They want to hear from other people, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, well, let's run with it. And the more people who contact me and tell me, the more I can't not do it. So... It's, we're nearly at a hundred episodes, and I'm That's so amazing. I'm so stoked that I'm that I'm there, and every single one of those people who has contacted me to be on a podcast or who I've contacted, I mean, we're talking about um, every one of them has had a stroke or is caring for somebody that had a stroke, and no matter we're at a hundred episodes, not one of those stories is the same story. Not one of those people has the same problems. They have similar challenges to overcome but everyone is unique so when you put out a new episode it sounds like the same same but people come out of nowhere and go wow like I can really relate to that episode it's not that different from the one before but they related to the one that got them thinking or changing their mindset or feeling like there's hope and and more importantly feeling like it's they're not alone it's not just about them so thanks exactly. for saying that. And I really, uh, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, it's just brought so much joy to me um, to be able to do this. I was going to ask you, how old were you when you had the first um, bleed? Ooh, um, I guess that's three years ago. I was 36 or 37, mm -hmm. I think. 36, 37. <laughs> I don't know, something yeah. like that. Yeah. 36 or 37 yeah close enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so 36 or 37 <coughs> excuse me was there any signs that a stroke or a bleed or something was coming on did you notice anything that was different the days leading up to it no not at all i mean i woke up and had double vision and i remember going downstairs and being like i can't I can't see. I don't know what's going on. And um, my family and the doctor I first went to thought it was just um, a sinus infection symptom because I had a sinus infection at the time. They thought I just had blurred vision or whatever. And I went to an eye doctor and she said, I think you need to have an MRI. So I went and got one and they found this shadow, what they said at first. And then I eventually went to a neurologist and that's when they kind of like consulted with other people and other neurologists and they determined that it was a cavernous malformation. Of course, I didn't know for sure 
until they got in there and looked at it. But, you know, all signs kind of pointed to that being the case. And it looks like they were right about yeah, it. They can't yeah. see it because the blood is still in there obstructing their view. So an MRI is not conclusive. And I got a similar diagnosis. There's a shadow on your brain and we don't know what caused it. And then they went down the path of, you know, it could be a tumor, it could be cancerous, it could be this, it could be that. And they didn't really know, in my head, they didn't really know for about two years because I opted not to have surgery. Mm -hmm. And then slowly the, the blood was small in size and then it got really big with the second bleed and then it got really small as it started to get absorbed and sorted out by my head. And... Um, and then they were able to see what caused it, but it took about two years. And um, finally, um, after the third blade, they figured that they need to go in and resolve that and get rid of it. Um, yeah. And that's when, and that's when all the major challenges sort of uh, happened to me as well. Um, so the, other than the blurred vision, was how long did it take before you went from blurred vision into hospital to do that MRI? Was it a lot of time that lapsed? I think um, it was about two or three weeks, maybe two weeks, um, because I just wasn't talking to the right people, honestly. And they just thought it was, they just didn't think anything about it. it you know, again, they thought it was a sinus infection or something. And I kind of saw various people before I saw you know, some really qualified neurologists that I'm still seeing to this day. Yeah. And uh, they, and they didn't want to do surgery at first. You know, they're like, we don't want to go into your brain stem. It's dangerous to do that. Let's just watch and wait and see what happens. And at first, you know, it looked like it was resolving um, or at least absorbing or at least not being active in, in bleeding. So after about eight months of checking on it, we decided to wait a year for the next scan. And unfortunately in that year time, it grew and bled more. And they think I had, you know, a few different episodes, mini strokes, you know, yeah. in that time that I yeah. just didn't even know about. Wow. So by the time I got the MRI, they were like, oops, it's too big. We got to go in there and get that out. Yeah. So we did, yeah. How long were you in hospital? The first time, I was hmm, like three or four days and I didn't even need any kind of rehab afterwards. I just went straight home. And then the second time after the hemorrhage and the stroke, I was in hospital and rehab altogether about three weeks. Yeah. Yeah, because I was um, in the hospital. They were kind of like waiting to stabilize me before the second surgery, waiting for my surgeon to like kind of get prepared. So I was in the hospital for about a week before the surgery and then a few days after and then rehab for about 10 or so days after that. Yeah. And then you were at home and who was with you at home? Were you, were you uh, around family? My husband was here. Yep. So he actually stayed with me the entire time in the hospital, like in the room with me. He stayed with me in rehab and then obviously here. And he had to do everything for me. I and mean, like I said, I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't get dressed. I couldn't get my own food or anything like that for a long time. And uh, so he had to do everything and work and take me to appointments and do, you know, errands and cooking and all that kind of stuff. So caregivers are amazing. I, I uh, we just never would have imagined everything that would go into something like this, but yeah, I remember. But now I've gotten much more independent, you know, much, much, much more independent. But those early days were rough. Yeah, I remember what my wife went through. She was the same for me. She was the person who did everything and she was navigating the whole thing on her own. And I was spaced out of my head and didn't really know what was going on. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, my emotions were all over the place. I was cranky and abusive at times and all sorts of things. And she was just running with it kind of like in in some kind of like a automatic kind of mode and it, it she had to be there for nearly three years by the time everything was sorted she had to be there for nearly three years you know and 
just can't imagine what that was like. She basically put her whole life on, on hold for me. And she had been doing that for my kids already. You know, she was a mom of two teenagers at the time. So I can't imagine what was going through her head. And uh, I'm grateful for her. She made a massive difference to my being able to heal and recover. Um, so then things started to get better. Did your husband, how was he about leaving you at home alone? How did he start to come around with all of that? Because I, I imagine there would have been some anxiety about that. Well, I really couldn't be alone for a while. So if he had to go somewhere, I'd have somebody here with me uh -huh. for a few months. And then eventually, you know, as I started getting more independent and capable, capable and strong, you know, he can leave. I mean, now it's not an issue, but, you know, it took a while. And then like, you know, if I wanted to go somewhere, very occasionally I would go somewhere with a friend. He would have a hard time with that because, you know, it's just kind of knowing what, I was going through and like how kind of like fragile I was, you know, it just kind of made him nervous to like, you know, think of me kind of being without him to like catch me if I fell or whatever, or got sick or something. Um, so that was an adjustment, you know, but we finally got into a good routine with that. Yeah. And he finally started yeah. to let you go. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, like I said, I couldn't even like shower or, go to the bathroom or get dressed or anything on my own for a long time. So, you know, even though that's not really something that we enjoyed, it kind of creates like a, I don't want to say a dependency, but like a, like a bond. bond that like, once you, like once I started becoming more independent, it was a good thing, but also I think it made him just nervous to kind of like, let me start doing those things on my own. Yeah. Hey, Ginger, yeah. are you comfortable me talking about intimacy? Sure. If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind, like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com, and download the guide. It's free. So, like me, when stroke happened, there was no intimacy. And then I had uh, a little bit of anxiety about going back to there because, because it was a bleed for me. My scenario playing in my mind was high blood pressure episode uh might <laughs> cause another bleed and i didn't want to do that to my wife in an intimate moment like how did right. you guys get back to that <laughs> i actually asked my doctor about that so i i can totally understand your concern um and she said oh it's fine um but you know for me also because i have i was suddenly disabled and like i don't have the use of half of my body that creates kind of a whole new set of obstacles. So, you know, it's been, it just, you know, it's been challenging, but, you know, that sort of thing requires a lot of open communication and patience and time and trust. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's a journey, you know, nothing's perfect, but, you know, we've been able to kind of like work through that a little bit. Yeah. Not easy, but, you know, put the time in and the effort and it's getting easier. Yeah. That's such a good thing to put time and effort into, isn't it? Yeah, I would say. Sure. <laughs> the reward is uh, well worth yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you guys are getting there. Hey, um, your, your name is Ginger. I mm -hmm. think either from the photos that I see and from the image in front of me, you have ginger hair. 
A little bit, yeah. And it's kind of purple on the ends. I don't know if you can tell or not. I but... can't there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you've got two cats that appear to be ginger. They are, yes, they are. And I'm surprised they're not running all over me right now. There's a bit of a ginger theme in your family. There, <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is, yes. The cats seem to get harassed. One of them's wearing your eye patch. <laughs> he loves it. I, I guarantee he loves to have, wear hats and the eye patch and wigs and yeah, I've seen the one. With the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. I'm sure, I'm sure he's thrilled by it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then there's the photo with both of you um, next to each other. You've you've cropped the photo, and you've got him yeah. and you with the eye patch on. <laughs> with the matching eye patch, yes. <laughs> that's hilarious. And then there's another one with um, a, a, a toy, cuddly lion that's on top of him. Mm-hmm. They're 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 two they're two different cats. They both are, they're twins. They're twin brothers. So uh -huh. the pictures are yeah are are like one or the other. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're very relaxed, like chill cats. They they tolerate almost anything. <laughs> Luckily, one of them's got a some kind of a jar or, <laughs> or a creamy a, a hand yep. cream thing on their head. <laughs> yes. Yep. Very patient uh, cats. They are very patient cats. So tell me about. What's it like to have an animal in your life? Because a lot of stroke survivors mm -hmm. who end up being alone or end up being um, stuck in their home or whatever uh, may not realize that animals can be very uh, therapeutic at times. Are you oh somebody who gets a lot from that? Yes, yes. I mean, and they are very, I like to think that they're very intuitive. So especially at first when I was just laying in bed and in the wheelchair, they were very confused, you know, because I couldn't pick them up. I couldn't like bend down to pet them, but they would just stay on me all the time. Like laying, I mean, you know, I would be in bed and they would just be one or both would be on me all the time. Um, and then they always wanted me to play with them and I couldn't, but now that I can, you know, it's so rewarding. I mean, I, I get, you know, a lot of the exercise I get is chasing them around and picking them up and doing things. Um, so, I mean, I can't imagine not having them here and being away from them for three weeks was really, really hard. I'd go into the hospital for the, when I was having the hemorrhage and going to the hospital and saying goodbye to them was like so difficult Wow! because I didn't know if I was going to see them again or what kind of condition I would be in when I came back. So it's just, it's just been like, I can't even, I don't have words for how rewarding it's been to have them yeah. here and how healing for sure. They're your fur babies. And I, they I, used are. To, I used to hear that and think, oh, that's a bit cringy, but it's not. When, <laughs> when I think about my experience with animals, we've had animals in our home for since I was a baby and they were always cats. So I have this very uh, unique uh, relationship with cats and animals. And I never really considered how much they do uh, just by being passive and being needy and whiny and whingy, <laughs> right. you know, they stimulate conversation because I yell at her, so to speak. I'll say, listen, you know, <laughs> stop behaving that way or don't go there or get out of there or stop making a mess with your food. And <laughs> and does she listen to you? Never. She just, no, no, sorry. she kind of does that. And then she just ignores <laughs> me because she's doing whatever she yeah. wanted. But the beauty of it is, is that that's creating a, conversation and a and a stimulus somewhere and then yeah. because cats are so needy with regards to when you get home if they're hungry you can't do anything other than feed them i mean they have to be fed and if you don't feed them oh, yeah. they won't be quiet so that whole relying on them relying on us is really cool because it makes us do things for someone else or something else that perhaps we wouldn't have done in the past and it's like you said it's it means that you're getting exercise. It means that you're bending, you're opening a can or you're preparing some food or you're cleaning their, their, their litter out. Is, do you see that as something that other people might benefit from in our situation? Absolutely. I mean, I think obviously there are the physical limitations to consider. Like if you, you've got to make sure you can care properly care for you're in the physical condition to care for an animal. But if you are, I think it's amazingly rewarding to, like you said, kind of have someone or something depend on you and 
you know, you kind of gives you something to do and like look at like, like a routine to get into and something to look after and the reward you get back, the love and the, the fun is just, it's so rewarding. Like it's just a whole package of, of reward, honestly. There's yeah. no downside to it, to me. And, and with a cat, you wouldn't call it unconditional love, would you? They, they. My cats, I don't know. They are, they are very constantly loving and okay. and uh, always wanting to be affectionate. So, and, and I know not all cats are like that, but for whatever reason, these cats are. Yeah, our, <laughs> our cat's not unconditionally loving. <laughs> loves I've heard, she, I've heard of cats like that. To, yeah. Yeah, when she wants to be um, loved she'll let you know by coming and sitting on you and yeah. if you want that in return from her and you go up and try and get a hug from her she's <laughs> not really keen you know yeah. she it's might let be you on their terms yeah. yeah yeah she might let you get away with it for a few minutes but not too long um and one of our previous guests claire caulfield on episode 92 she told me she's a, a lady who's approaching her 70th birthday and she told me she only got a cat after her stroke in the last few years and she never had an animal before in her life to care for. And she could not believe what she's been missing out on. She just said, it is amazing to think that she not once in her life considered that a pet might be something that would give her companionship, make her feel better, um, love her, that she could love and care for. She just, and she's a, a, a mum. She's had... Um, yeah. that relationship with somebody before, but she just couldn't imagine herself doing that with an animal. And now that she has, she just can't understand how she didn't go down that path. Right. Yeah, I didn't have pets growing up. So I didn't understand either. Like when I, when I got these cats, like I didn't know it could be so just like how much like love and fun and enjoyment you could get from having an animal I just I just didn't know I didn't have that context really so I mean I'm just grateful so I'm just very grateful that we had them and they were here for uh, both of us my husband and I both you know they provided lots of like support I don't know if it's the right word but just you know just joy and fun and love through all this craziness yeah we have two children they're not they're way beyond 18 years of age now Christine and I my wife and I and um now it's all about, it's become about the cat. So before it was, oh, the kids did this or the kids yeah. did that. And now it's about the cat. And now I do stuff like say, if you do that, if you misbehave, I'm going to tell your mum on you. And then <laughs> we do that too. Her mum will be there, and I'll be, and Christine will be going, eh, eh, don't worry about it, ignore <laughs> it, you know. So, very interesting interaction that we all have, all the three of us and the kids that we all have together now. She's definitely a member of the family. Um, oh, she yeah. runs the show. She owns one of the chairs that nobody else mm -hmm. can go to. And, um, yeah, it's just something that I think some people who are stroke survivors might consider going down Absolutely. that path with some kind of a real gentle, easy-to-care-for animal. And ca cats tend to be mostly easy to care for because yeah, they sleep a lot. Yeah, they're, and they're pretty independent and they can go – you know, you don't have to take them outside all the time or walk them and things like that. And so, yeah, I, I recommend, I recommend cats for lots of reasons, but that's definitely a good one. The low maintenance aspect of it, for sure. Yeah. Nothing like some good old animal therapy. Hey, um, yeah. so now that you're three years out of post stroke and. Well, more like a year and a half, three years started the eye stuff. And then my stroke happened about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Other than the physical challenges of uh, weakness on the left side and the things that you described already, um, what are some of the things that you hope to overcome so that you can start changing your focus? Because I got to that point where I thought, all right, I've got to start overcoming certain things so I can change my focus and find a new way to include myself in the world. What, what are some of those things that you're hoping to overcome? Well, I think that as time is going on and I'm becoming more accustomed to the physical limitations that I had, and it's also, and they're also like getting better. Like I'm working really hard to work on my walking. Like I can walk without, like, without a cane now. I was on a, I was on a, in a wheelchair for a while, then a walker, then a cane, and now I'm walking 
without anything. And that's, you know, I've really kind of focused a lot on my physical strength and getting kind of back as much into much as much shape as I can. But then also, I think learning how to adapt to the outside world with whatever physical limitation I'm experiencing in the moment with the division or balance or whatever, figuring out how to not get overwhelmed and stressed out when I go out in public and go into new situations because I want, I mean, I very much am a person who likes to be out doing things and I don't want these things to stop me. I want to figure out a way to be comfortable kind of no matter what. So I know that sounds kind of vague, but I'm trying to kind of approach it from like a, you know, broad, bigger picture kind of outlook so that I can be adaptable. Cause you know, in my situation, you know, you have good days, you have bad days, bad weeks, good weeks, you know, I want to be able to enjoy life kind of no matter what. So I like that being broad is actually really good. Uh, yeah. on in stroke recovery because if you want to play basketball from the moment that you got out of surgery and you can't do that yet that's right. going to be frustrating because that's a yeah. really big skill to be able to achieve uh, for some people it's going to be hard and perhaps very um, frustrating but if you want to just do something broad like i want to be able to just stand that's really more doable than running at the beginning yeah and i remember going through rehab and my uh and my therapist asking me, what did I want to do? And I said to him, well, I want to be able to just go into a swimming pool so that when I'm walking uh, in the swimming pool and retraining myself to walk, I don't have to be afraid of falling over. That's it. Mm. And they put me into a swimming pool. And then that started this, maybe from the walking in the swimming pool, I'll walk outside on my own and so on. And then that started to change as, as I went through therapy. And then about six months after I was home after surgery, my uh, outpatient therapist said to me, what do you want to achieve? And I said, I'd like to run. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, not a marathon or anything, just across the road so that I can get out of the way of a car if it's coming. And it was such a, it started to become more fine tuned why I needed yeah. to run and why I needed to walk. And, and, and they had a, a purpose behind it. And I got there. And I don't enjoy running, but now I can run on a treadmill if I want to. That's amazing. You know, for about five minutes or so. And that's five minutes more than I really care to, really. Um, and I don't enjoy running either, but yeah, I, <laughs> I understand. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So being broad, I think, is great so that you can narrow it down later. And it's like having, mm. it's like trying to work out what career you want to do when you know, you, you leave school. Well, I don't really know. I'll just try something and I'll see how it goes. And if it goes well, I'll continue that down that path. If I don't like it, I'll try something new. Yeah. I think flexibility has been like one of the biggest, oops, sorry, um, learning to be flexible and adaptable has been one of the biggest challenges for me, you know, um, because you don't really know, like I didn't know early on, and I still don't know what my abilities are going to be a year from now, a month from now, a week from now. And at first, you know, <laughs> I remember going into rehab and then asking what my goal was. And my goal was to walk out of rehab on my own. Well, I learned very quickly that that wasn't going to happen. So my, my next goal was transferring from the bed to the wheelchair safely. And that was the goal. And that's what I accomplished before I left. And over time, I've kind of learned to set smaller, kind of more Doable. general goals. Yeah. And, um, and just recently, um, you know, after I've kind of been used to kind of walking around the house on my own without the cane, um, I wanted to work on my stamina because I can only kind of walk a little bit at a time before I get very tired mm -hmm. and worn out. So I started on the treadmill. Like I could only do about 30 seconds at first. It was very painful and, and hard. And now I'm up to almost seven minutes of solid walking, which I thought I would, could never do. I could say it's, it seems impossible really. So that's kind of shown me too, that I can actually accomplish things that I didn't think I could do before. 
And now these kind of like more generic, like exactly what you said, like these sort of broader goals, I can like make more specific and kind of like actually get more targeted with what I'm trying to do. And it feels really good to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's okay to have the big goal, yeah, that I'm going to walk yeah. out of hospital again. Because if you don't get there, what that means is now you've got some feedback and you can look back and go, okay, what am I lacking to actually be able to do that? Yeah. And now I can focus on those things that I'm missing, which if I did, might help me. Perhaps I don't have enough time to walk out of hospital, but I have enough time to walk out of, you know, whatever, whenever. Yeah. So don't true. use, let's not get that big goal and be upset that we didn't reach it. Let's just use it as the, okay, the benchmark of, oh, okay, so that big goal is made up of a whole bunch of little goals. And if I achieve one of those and then the next one and the next one, then before you know it, if I look back and reflect maybe in 12 months time, maybe I'm further along than I expected. And that's okay. That means you yeah, don't that's feel, true. That means you don't feel overwhelmed and that means you don't feel like a failure or that, me that means that you don't get concerned too much about not having achieved that yet. And I, yeah. I didn't have any goals or ideas or thoughts about what I was going to do. I just knew that I was going to walk when, I was asked um, when I kind of contemplated the possibilities of what might happen to me after surgery, I expected the worst in that I expected that I wasn't going to be able to do anything with my left side after, after surgery. And that kind of almost was the situation. And then I just made the goal of now I'm going to walk. So I, I didn't think about, Anything else, a timeline or when or how or what? Because I, I started to get these lessons about time at the beginning, three years almost before that. Because every time I thought I was going to get my memory back or every time I thought I was going to be able to do a calculation or drive or write, all those timelines got stretched out by things that were out of my control. So that by the time I got to surgery, I was like, okay, I don't know how long this is going to take. But I'm just going to go on the, on the, on the path to achieving that outcome. And whenever I get there, I get there. I had to kind of learn to approach it that way too, you know, and I think it, and also that there was kind of like a not fully understanding my situation, not fully understanding kind of what had happened to me. Like it all happened very quickly. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. Sometimes these things just happen like in the blink of an eye. And then it takes a while to kind of catch up to oh, this really happened and this, it did this thing to me and it's going to take this amount of work or, you know, a general sort of like idea of this kind of work that I have to do to like kind of get past it. And it's a lot for people to like understand and wrap their minds around, you know, yeah. you're processing the trauma of what happened to you and figuring out what your body is doing. And so it's a real process, a heavy one. I mean, a rewarding one, you know? Yeah. It maybe it doesn't always feel that way, yeah. but it's definitely a process. And it's shitty as well. The whole yeah. time it's <laughs> shitty. Like you're going through this really shitty time. And before that, you don't have any skills. You don't have any way of uh, l knowing how to navigate a stroke. I mean, that's right. you don't learn these things until you're in it. It's like having kids. You just got no idea what the hell you're doing until you have one. And then you're trying to sort of work it out. And you, if you don't upgrade the, the kind of level that you're at, and I'm not talking about um, uh, learning more things or reading more books, I'm talking about upgrade yourself and your identity that a, I am a learner or I'm now somebody that doesn't give up or I'm now somebody who is always going to uh, strive for improvement, whether it takes one day, one hour, one week, one year, it doesn't matter. I'm going to always... Now, you've got to upgrade yourself to get through that process and mindset plays a massive role. Mm. What, I, what was your mindset like before stroke and is it similar and or different now? It's very different. You know, I can't even, you know, I, it's hard for me to even kind of identify what my mindset, you know, would be. I mean, you know, I've kind of always been a positive person, but um, you know, sort of like a day by day, kind of take it 
take it day by day sort of thing. And I guess in some ways I am still like that, you know, I mean, I really had to be that like that now because every day is different, but. Um, so what I'm saying, what I'm asking is. Yeah. How much does mindset play in your recovery? Because you're going to have the bad days. Let's face mm -hmm. it, we're both sitting here being quite um, energetic and talkative and the rest of it, but we're going to have our crappy days. So how much does mindset play a role in getting you through those darker days or those more difficult days or those days where you're doing really shit self-talk? Oh, gosh, it's huge. And I, you know, I really struggle with that too. At first, you know, I just didn't know how to, like, you know, I would have the bad days or the bad weeks, you know, and feel like this is the this is just permanent. This is the way it's going to always be. I don't know how to get out of this. And over time, you know, and and honestly, therapy has been a huge, like, mental health therapy has been a huge help for me. Learning how to kind of break out those those patterns and sort of like be able to pull back and say and just be really kind to myself, like kindness and compassion towards yourself is key mm -hmm. being gentle being loving because you just never know what you're going to get and on the dark days just kind of like the understanding that it will pass and you know everything is temporary and your energy kind of moves in a flow yeah. and the dark days will be over and then you'll have the up days again and it's just always a wave so i think i kind of said this earlier that the flexibility and the ability to adapt are huge and then also just just having as much kindness and compassion towards yourself even on the dark days when you're telling your yourself all these negative things learning how to maybe step out of that and kind of like figure out how to talk to yourself in, in a nice way even through the darkness I remember is having, really important yeah i remember having some days where I, I would be feeling a certain way you know really negative kind of uh, experience and my wife would be trying to work out what's going on and I, I think I finally got to that point where I said I I'm having a shit day and I want to have a shit day and I want to be shitty and I don't want to be happy and I don't <laughs> want to be I just want to be the way I'm being and I I'm sorry if it's affecting you negatively or bothering you I'll be okay in a day or tomorrow or in an hour but right now I just need to be like this I can't change it I don't know what to do to change it so I just want to be it and then just being able but to you know yeah, I was going to say, being able to like express that and identify yeah. this, what's going on, yeah. is huge. Yeah. And that's the most I could do. I couldn't say any more than that. I just feel shit. I want to feel shit. I want to stay here. I don't want to change. And I want to bitch and moan and complain. Um, and, and hopefully I'll stop at some point. Um, but it's not about you. I I'm really don't want you to get upset and annoyed and offended at me or any of that stuff. I just want you to know it's something that I'm going through. That was a, a, it took a long time for me to get to that. And then, you know, what's cool about that is that thing gives her permission to say that back to me because yeah. she had the same terrible days that I had because of me and because of what I was going through. She was going through the same thing, feeling stuck, isolated, you know, her identity is coming into question. Am I going to become a carer for this guy now for the rest of his life? You know, I don't know what she was thinking. So, but it gave her permission to be like that. I, I recently also did an episode, episode 80, 82, which was about how to have a growth mindset. Mm. And that is really an important thing. You know, there's, if you can have a growth mindset and you can have just small amounts of growth, and that for me was growth, being able to just sit in my state and accept that I was this way allowed me to have this growth mindset, allowed me to start talking about um, things that I had never spoken before because it wasn't okay to be shitty in our house before that. You know, that that's not what you do. Yeah. You, you don't act that way. You don't be that way. Snap out of it was the kind of usual approach. And the usual approach doesn't work in these situations. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I mean all that sounds very, very familiar but you know it takes a long time to kind of be able to recognize those patterns and you know that feeling shitty and, and feeling like you're being shitty just feels shitty and you can't really see much more beyond that so when you get to the point when you can kind of see okay I'm going to feel this way for a bit I'm going to let myself just write it out and then it'll, it'll pass and you know it takes a long time to to get there to get that kind of understanding yeah. but 
you know, then once you kind of accept that it's going to happen from time to time, you can manage it better. Yeah. You can just stay, stay there and know that it's going to end. And really right. that, that feeling that way, it, it's kind of, for me, it was embodied. It started in, in my body and then it ended up in my state of mind. You know, it kind of was a loop. And if my body felt unwell, then my mind followed. And then as my body started to rest and relax and I started to get better, then my mind, my mind came back. Mm -hmm. I was just allowed, allowed myself to go through that cycle and, um, and then learn that when I felt this way, it was the sign. It was, okay, sit down, rest, recover, do nothing, go nowhere and just heal and just relax and just get better. And that's what I have now. I have this massive signal of now's the time to rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, again, I can really relate. I can really relate to that. It's like, you know, it's being able to kind of be more in tune with your body and, you know, what, how it's going to affect everything else around you. Mm. It's a gift to be able to sort of like be able to pay attention to that and yeah. react or not react accordingly. Yeah. And, and and if people listening aren't there yet, they'll get there. You'll get there. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. you know? um, you're a year and a half almost or kind of out of sh your surgery and nearly three it's years surgery. into the whole journey. Yeah. Somebody who is listening to this might be earlier on in their journey and their experience. What would you say to them now reflecting back? What would you say actually to yourself reflecting mm -hmm. on what you already know? Oh gosh. Um, just to, just to be patient. And again, just try to be as patient and kind and loving through the process because it's brand new and, you know, there are going to be some really dark days and you may not understand what's going on, you know, at any given point, but you know, this, even though it might feel like this, kind of bad stuff, negative feeling, emotions, mood um, is going to last forever. It's not going to, you know, time moves on. And um, also just learning to accept whatever kind of state you're in, in the moment, accept it and um, just try to be patient and kind to yourself. I think that was the, that was the biggest thing that I had to really learn for early on for me because it was just, I didn't know how to do that very well. It was very hard to myself. Oh, I can't do this thing. I can't do that thing. I can't do this anymore. Why can't I do it? You know, I should be walking by now. I should be doing this by now. You just get buried in shoulds. Yeah. So just, just to kind of like step back and just try to accept the process and love yourself through it. Yeah. You're, you strike me as somebody who will find a new way to do your life, to be yourself and to express yourself. And being somebody who is a, a graphic artist, you'll get a lot actually from uh, checking out that um, The Great Now What. Um, Maggie is somebody who is visually creative as well. And she created to try and explain to people what it was that she was feeling. She created some uh, figurines from, uh, I think they were Barbie dolls. And mm. on one of them, she added uh, clay on the left side to show the difference in how she felt in her body to express that to somebody who couldn't see what, mm. what she was experiencing. And then on another one, because she has um, sensitivity, um, hypersensitivity issues, on her skin she wrapped one in barbed wire and then um, she has a couple of different versions of that and she's somebody who those figurines they painted such a, a powerful picture instantly when you look at them you can just go yep exactly that's me that's how I feel um, mm -hmm. so when we're done with the podcast I'll send you a link to that episode and then you can just yes, look please. up the great now what. And Maggie is somebody who is going to, uh, and I think she already has um, participated in a play that's done by 
um, an organization who supports uh, actors that come from all walks of life that are dealing with some kind of a disability. And um, mm. it's a really powerful, uh, it's a really powerful organization because it enables so many people to express themselves and to, you know, go back into the, into the arts. So it's really amazing. So I, I have sounds a feeling amazing. That, wow. Yeah, you'll love it. I have a feeling that um, you'll get there as well um, because I also look at your Insta and I see there's a different colored eye patch and a different textured eye patch. For, <laughs> is that for every day? <laughs> oh, I wish. I wish I had that many, but, you know, just kind of depending on my mood or my outfit or my hair. Yeah, I've got um, a purple one, a blue one, a red one, black, glitter, all kinds of different ones. <laughs> I, love I love it. it. I love it. Good on you. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And thank more importantly, you. thank you for being brave and finding the courage to put yourself out there. Uh, because from that, I think you'll grow and you'll become the kind of person who, uh, who who's once again, in spite of what's happened to you, able to be comfortable in your own skin, feeling positive about life and you know really making a difference to people and this is so selfless doing what you did is so selfless and i really appreciate that because that makes a massive difference to all the other people listening thank you you know and, and kind of i want to add to that a little bit i um i know that you know the facial weakness for i use this for an example of facial weakness and eye damage is probably pretty typical with strokes many strokes um, and I personally don't see a lot of other people with the facial weakness, facial paralysis out there. So I kind of wanted to, I was very nervous to do this, you know, it's on the video, on the video part anyway, mm. not very nervous, a little bit nervous. Um, yeah. but I wanted to kind of show that it's okay to have a facial weakness and to wear an eye patch. It's cool. It's, it's great. You know, um, so I appreciate that you've given me an opportunity to, to share my story with you and with your listeners and followers. And I just really appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.